Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast and this is part three of the story of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. This is the concluding episode in the series, which marks the 110th anniversary of the fire, which is upcoming in March 2021. If you haven't heard the first two episodes, it's worth checking out those first. As I explained in previous instalments, the series is a joint project by myself, Finn DeWire, and the New York author, Hope Sitar. Hope lives in Manhattan and holds a master's in psychology and a PhD in education from the Catholic University of America. She is the award-winning author of 25 historical and contemporary romance novels, including Operation Cinderella, formerly optioned by Fox, and a founder and curator of the Manhattan Lady Jane Salon reading series from 2009 to 2020. Irish Eyes, currently on submission, is Hope's women's historical fiction set on the Iron Islands and Gilded Age Manhattan. Her screenplays, four so far, include Stolen Kiss, a female buddy heist feature with Emmy Award winning producer and director Linda Yellen, now in development. You can find out more at hopectar.com and follow her on Twitter at HopeTar, where she shares cool ephemera and fun historical snippets. There's links in the description below. Finally, before we begin, a word on the sources used in the podcast. The series follows the lives of some of the poor in early 20th century New York, people who lived on the margins. One of the individuals featured in the series is Annie Doherty, who was born in Donegal in 1886. She emigrated to the USA in 1905 and lived there until at least 1920. Her age and life experience indicates she was the same Irish woman who appears in New York records in 1911 and plays a pivotal role in the following events. As you will hear, it is not possible to say with complete certainty the two women are the same individual, but at the very least, their combined life experience is certainly one common to Irish people in New York, which shaped the following events. The second individual is Celia Walker, for whom we have a complete unbroken historical record, from her emigration as a young child to her death. Additional narrations in this episode are by Hope, and the sound in the series is by Jason Looney. On the 25th of March, 1911, newspaper editors in New York were faced with difficult decisions. They had to try and convey to their readers details of what was a horrifying story unfolding in Lower Manhattan. On that fateful March Saturday afternoon, a plume of black smoke pushed skyward over the city, an acrid haze cloaking Washington Square and its surrounds, where by 5pm more than 10,000 anxious spectators had gathered, frantically pushing against the police barricades. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, one of the major manufacturers of ready-made ladies' blouses on America's east coast, was aflame, the fire having begun on the 8th floor and funneling upwards to the factory's ninth and 10th floors as well. Though the blaze was brought under control in just 30 minutes and the building spared, the walls and floors as good as ever, the material casualties mainly some ruined furniture. Many of the workers within were far less fortunate. The death toll, which would be finalised in the coming days, was catastrophic. 146 workers killed and 78 seriously injured. In an effort to illustrate the gravity of what had happened, the New York Times chose to include two photographs in their lead article in a time when the newspaper often went out without any photos. Under a headline proclaiming 141 die in waste factory fire, a figure that would later rise, a grainy photograph captured the burning building. On the accompanying picture, journalists had marked nine windows on the 8th, ninth, and 10th floors of the Ash Building, which housed the Triangle Factory with an X. It had been from these very windows, readers were informed, that desperate workers had jumped to their deaths to escape the building. The extensive reporting over three pages provided more vivid detail that personalised the catastrophe. These included the plight of a teenage girl who had clung to a windowsill for several minutes before falling to her death and that of a couple who appeared at the window before embracing with a kiss and then jumping together. They too died in their desperate attempt to escape the flames. The second Times photograph captured the debris strewn on the street below, accompanied by a caption informing readers that an hour after that very picture had been taken, two victims were found alive. This was the closest readers would get to live on-the-scene reporting before the age of television. Over the coming days, the reality of the fire and the horrendous death toll left the entire city in shock. Initially placed at 141, the number of fatalities increased to 146 as some of those who had survived succumbed to their wounds. During that terrible week, the press continued to report stories of unrelenting grief. While families claimed the remains of their loved ones, 
in advance of funerals, there were also the unidentified and in some cases unidentifiable bodies, the latter eventually buried by the city of New York. Given that the faith of the victims, as well as their identity, was unknown, a Catholic, Protestant and Jewish ceremony was held. Those who suffered most were the communities of Eastern European Jews and Italians who had comprised the overwhelming majority of workers, however many working-class neighbourhoods across Manhattan were touched. In these communities, it was much more than a terrible catastrophe that could be put out of mind when a newspaper was filed away. It was their family, friends and neighbours who had died. The outpouring of grief that surrounded the funerals quickly hardened into a rising bitterness and anger. Even if the precise nature of the fire could not have been predicted, the workers had raised the dangerous conditions in the Triangle Factory during what was known as the Uprising of the 20,000, a prolonged and bitter strike in the garment industry in 1909 and 1910. That the Triangle Factory owners, Max Blank and Isaac Harris, were complicit in the fire and its grisly outcome were self-evident in just about everyone's eyes. Though the ash building housing the factory was a modern skyscraper less than a decade old, the factory's owners and policies concerning their workers were hardly better than medieval. From the outset, Blank and Harris, dubbed the Shirtwaist Kings, had operated their Washington Place factory and their other workshops on the East Coast as a sweatshop in every way, blatantly refusing to implement even the most basic measures of worker safety. However, in the aftermath, they denied any culpability. In what must have been a galling slap in the face for the survivors and their families, on March the 29th, the New York Times printed a testimony from Isaac Harris in which he portrayed himself as something of a hero, leading over 70 workers to safety. In fact, he had fled, along with his partner and Blank's two younger daughters, from the 10th floor offices to the rooftop, climbing over to the adjacent building and safety. He had no words of remorse, nor actions of remorse either. Families of the deceased received a token benefit from the shirtwaist kings in recompense for their lost loved ones, the equivalent of one week's wages. Blank and Harris would be forced to pay $75 per person in a civil lawsuit in 1914. However, the victims or their families never received any true justice. Their attitude only served to inflame the rising anger in working class New York. The public would not let the story rest. Many appealed to their elected representatives to demand that some action be taken. In the weeks and months ahead, the Triangle Fire continued to dominate New York City and state news. For once, political allegiances took a back seat to upholding justice and the greater good. Christian or Jew, Protestant or Catholic, Conservative or Progressive, the aggrieved public gathered in churches, synagogues and lastly, the streets. The International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union pushed for an official day of mourning for the dead. Labour and trade unions, religious communities, social reform organisations and political organisations, most notably Tammany Hall, the city's Democratic Party machine, joined forces to demand real substantive progress in worker protections. Women largely led the way in transforming the sea of fury, grief and moral outrage into measurable practical reform. Progressives led by Florence Kelly of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union and Frances Perkins, then Executive Secretary of the New York Committee on Safety and later the first female Cabinet Secretary under President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, joined with Tammany leaders, notably Al Smith, to form a commission to review conditions in factories and sweatshops across the state. Within one month of the fire, the New York State Factory Investigation Committee was formed to investigate the Triangle Fire. Damning detail of what had happened in the Triangle Factory emerged. It quickly came to light that the Ash Building had experienced four recent fires and been reported as unsafe to the city's building department due to an insufficiency of working exits, including fire escapes blocked with bolts of fabric and equipment. Prior to the tragedy, Fire Chief Edward F. Croker nephew to a former Tammany boss, Richard Croker, had made a public appeal for better enforcement of the existing fire code, as well as instituting additional life-saving reforms. But the factory owners, Blank and Harris, had powerful allies in the city, notably the Manufacturers Association, which had convened a meeting on Wall Street to counter Croker. Installing more fire escapes and keeping existing exits unblocked would cost too clearly, its fellows argued. The Building Commission concurred, signing off on the factory as fireproof without requiring a single modification. It cost the lives of 146 people to prove that this had not been the case. Immediately following the fire, 
Blank and Harris undertook a substantial advertising campaign to repair their damaged reputations. They hosted reporters from the New York Times in Harris's home, defending their actions to the public and insisting that they had taken all the necessary precautions. Still, the public outrage continued, with people clamouring for the owners to be held responsible for the disaster. On April the 11th, 1911, Harris and Blank were indicted on seven counts of manslaughter in the first and second degree. Then, 20-year-old Celia Walker, whose life was recalled in the previous episodes, was one of the 155 witnesses called to testify in the case, where she was subjected to a hostile cross-examination. The defence attorney, Max Dyer, asked her to describe how she made her way across the factory, and she explained how she jumped across the aisles from machine table to machine table. Showing no compassion and determination to tear apart her story, Steyer followed up by asking, Was your skirt about as tight as the skirt you've on now? Keeping her composure, Celia answered no and added that she was used to the practice of jumping when she was a child. Regardless of the mass of evidence against them, the owners were cleared of any wrongdoing and free to carry on as before. In practice, they already had. Just three days after the fire, Blank and Harris reopened at University Place, so close to the fire site that passers-by still smelled ash in the air. One day in, the city building department found that the new headquarters was a fire trap on part of the previous Triangle Factory, the exit to the single fire escape blocked by not one but two rows of sewing machines. While Blank and Harris could spend large resources to repair their tarnished reputations and restart their businesses, the same could not be said for their employees. As poor immigrants whose precarious existence had been so ruthlessly exploited by the shirtwaist kings, they were more focused on survival. The two emigrants covered in the series to date, Annie Doherty from County Donegal and Celia Walker from Primozhil in Poland, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, illustrated the struggles they returned to. Both Annie and Celia were working on the factory's ninth floor, soon to be known as the death floor for its high fatalities when the fire broke out. Annie as a sewing machine operator and Celia as a finisher, tasked with inspecting the completed shirt waists. Both women had managed to escape the flames and save themselves. Annie by following a little lone stairwell to the 10th floor and from there to the rooftop where she was able to climb over to the adjacent law school building and descend to the street. Celia had grabbed hold of an elevator cable and jumped atop a loaded elevator car on what was its final descent. After the fire, their lives took very different paths. Annie would, as we will see, vanish within a decade, while Celia would slowly rebuild her life, although like all survivors of the fire, she was never able to forget what had happened on that fateful day. The two women's very different lives after the fire were to an extent shaped by their emigrant experiences. Annie who, as we have seen, was an elusive figure in the historical record, was almost certainly a Catholic from Donegal, who had emigrated to the US as an adult in 1905 with her younger sister, Mary. Celia was a Jew from Eastern Europe, who had come over as a young child with her mother and siblings. Once in New York, Annie and her sister Mary were far from their family and the community that had provided them support. However, Celia had a very different experience. At the time of her arrival, the Walker family was somewhat established. Her father, Abraham, had emigrated several years earlier and had secured both a home and job in Manhattan's Lower East Side. Celia quickly took to the mannerisms of her adopted homeland. As a young adult, she boasted of her American-styled speech, mannerisms and flair for fashion, all of which enabled her to pass herself off as American-born, a point of envy and admiration among the other women and girls on the Triangle shop floor, most of whom spoke English as a second language, if they spoke it at all, as Celia later recalled. When I worked in the Triangle shop, all the other girls looked on me like I was a real Yankee. When we came to this country, I was only five years old. And by the time I went to work in the shop, I spoke with a real American accent. In the Triangle Company, I am sure that the girls thought I was American born. In contrast, Annie, who had emigrated as an adult, would have remained something of an outsider to many New Yorkers. When she arrived, she may well have been dressed in homespun attire. This, along with her Irish accent, while not uncommon in early 20th century New York, marked her as an emigrant straight away. While the more extreme anti-Irish racism of the 1850s was in decline, prejudice against Irish, indeed a wider anti-emigrant sentiment, was dying a far slower death. Annie disappears from the public record after the 1920 US census, 
the Annie Doherty who had emigrated to the US in 1905 and had been living in Hell's Kitchen in 1910 remained at this same address until at least 1920. However, it has proven difficult to trace her life with any certainty after this point. While some workers like Celia, as we will see, would attempt to gain redress in the courts, there's no evidence Annie did. Her life after 1920 is something of a mystery. This begs the question, did she return to Ireland or perhaps die in the US? Could she have relocated? How had the fire impacted her later life? There's no definitive evidence to reveal these details. The multiple spellings and misspellings of her surname, Doherty, make tracing her life very difficult. The presence of a Mary Doherty at the death of her father, Patrick, on February the 3rd, 1924, could suggest her sister Mary, at least, may have returned home. However, even this cannot be said with any certainty. There were other Mary Doherty's living in their home village of Beogmore. Annie's disappearance from the record after 1920, when she was only in her 30s, doesn't necessarily suggest anything nefarious, but it does highlight the precarious life many emigrants endured in New York in the early 20th century. They were invisible to many. Indeed, it was this attitude which had allowed dangerous workplaces, sweatshops such as the Triangle Factory, to flourish. While we cannot infer much from Annie Doherty's life after the fire, Celia Walker's later life is well preserved in the historical record. Indeed, she would be a living testimony to the legacy of the fire. Celia would enjoy modest successes. Her story was in many ways that of an American Cinderella, but only to a point, a more realistic experience of the rags to riches fairy tale. While the Triangle factory owners Harris and Blank were acquitted at their trial, Celia, through the support of her family, unlike Annie Doherty, was able to seek redress in the form of a civil suit. On June the 11th, 1911, the Brooklyn Eagle reported that Abraham Walker, on behalf of his daughter Celia, mistakenly listed as being 14 years old, had hired the attorney, Abraham Oberstein, to sue the Triangle owners for damages. Oberstein didn't work for free or for cheap. No further coverage of the civil suit exists and it seems safe to surmise that Abraham eventually dropped the case for lack of funds. After recovering from her wounds, Celia quit the Triangle Factory, which had relocated to nearby Irving Place within a shocking three days after the tragedy. She took a position at another garment concern, the Mayor and Friedman Company, founded that same year of 1911. At Mayor and Friedman, Celia would meet her future husband, one of the founding partners. Born in Philadelphia to Max and Mamie Friedman, Morris A. Friedman, aged 27, is described as having brown hair, grey eyes and a slender medium build. On the 6th of June 1915, Celia, then 24, married Morris in a simple ceremony attended by family and close friends. Despite his career ups and downs, Morris's World War I draft card lists him not as a business owner, but as a salesman for A. Glazeroff and Company. He was able to support Celia and their two children, Sybil and Stanley, without Celia having to take on outside work. US Census reports for 1925, 1930 and 1940 all list Celia as an unpaid family worker. The Freedmans spent their more than 40 years of married life at various rental residences in the Bronx, lastly in the Fordham area. Celia Walker's later life, however, highlighted how the fire haunted the lives of those who had survived. In 1957, in preparation for the upcoming 50th anniversary of the Triangle Fire, union activist and journalist Leon Stein began placing notices in local newspapers soliciting contributions of survivor recollections of the fire. Stein had planned to write an extended article for Justice, the membership publication of the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union, on which he served as editor and contributor. Even though 46 years had passed since the fire, Celia came forward to give her account. Indeed, she was one of 19 survivors who did so, and owing to the large number of responses he received and the richness of material in the interviews given, Stein decided to write a book instead. While he worked away on compiling the accounts, Celia would lose her husband Morris, who passed away in 1960 after 45 years of marriage. The following year, however, she would play an important role in the 50th anniversary memorial meeting of the Triangle, which was held on the 25th of March 1961. This was an emotional event, to say the least. The Ash Building, renamed the Brown Building, looked 
eerily unchanged on the exterior, its roof line still aligned with that of the neighbouring building, a feature that had allowed the shirtwaist kings and their office workers to escape. By the 1960s, it housed chemistry labs for New York University. For these new occupants, the fire had entered folklore. On the upper three of the building's ten floors, university staff claimed they spotted a side-eye blur of something falling outside their windows, only to race over and see nothing on the sidewalk below. Doors locked tight, only to be discovered unlocked minutes later. Other reports included an acrid odour that crept in at random hours, not burnt popcorn, but in line with charred flesh. One secretary's sighting of a frantic young woman with singed hair and out more the clothing, racing around the corner to Green Street, only to vanish in thin air. The return of the survivors for the 50th anniversary must have brought home the sobering reality, though, of what the fire had been truly like. On March the 25th, 1961, 14 survivors, including a 70-year-old Celia Walker Friedman, took part in a commemorative ceremony and speeches outside the old Ash building at the corner of Green Street and Washington Place, a site most of them had spent the past half-century avoiding. The commemoration event was sponsored by the International Ladies Garment Workers Union with New York University and the New York Fire Department. There was no question New York had changed in the intervening years. The status of workers and indeed women workers in particular had improved and the fire 50 years previously had been a crucial milestone in those changes. Taking the stage that day to address the crowds and shake hands with Celia and her fellow workers were three powerhouse personages, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Frances Perkins, the US Secretary of Labour under President Franklin D. Roosevelt and the first US woman to hold a cabinet position and Rose Schneiderman, a triangle survivor herself who'd gone on to make a name as a nationally known suffragist and labour leader. One can only imagine the awe and perhaps irony that Celia and the others must have felt as they reflected on their humble beginnings from immigrant sweatshop workers to being hailed as heroes by a former first lady. Later, the massive fire bell tolled for those who died in a special corps of uniformed firemen along with the fire commissioner, Edward Francis Kavanagh, gave the salute. While the memorial event may have symbolised the changes that had taken place over the previous decades, events elsewhere that same year served as a reminder that those hard-won improvements could not be taken for granted. At the New York State Capitol in Albany, awaiting the signature of Nelson Rockefeller, the Republican governor of New York, was a bill that would have rolled back many of the hard-won workplace safety reforms achieved in the wake of the Triangle Fire. Reforms painstakingly fought for and put into place to keep the Triangle's tragic history from repeating. To some standing on the platform that day, it must have seemed as if the passage of time had made little difference. Indeed, it was only fitting that in this climate of the early 1960s that Leon Stein would publish his book On the Fire based around the interviews of survivors, not only as a record for posterity, but a stark reminder of the changes these women had lived through and helped achieve. Simply titled The Triangle Fire, it was first published in 1962 and later republished in 2010 for the fire's centennial and continues to be considered the definitive treatise on the tragedy. That Stein was able to solicit positive responses from so many survivors, as well as city newspaper reporters and columnists who'd covered the fire contemporaneously, is a story in itself. The men and women who'd come up under the Gilded Age were not the ones to air their feelings in public, let alone for the pages of a book. Stein himself reflected that a quiet pattern of interviews was an initial reluctance to speak, then a sudden emotional outpouring of memories subsiding into lengthy, calm series of recollections. Despite the passage of nearly half a century, the oral histories Steen took down from survivors like Celia are not only rich in detail, but also remarkably consistent in recalling the facts of the fire. By then, all interviewees were in some respects tormented by the tragedy for the rest of their lives, not only haunted by their own near brushes with death, but burdened by grief for the friends and co-workers needlessly lost. We certainly know this to be the case for Celia. Nearly a half a century later, the acrimony with which she attested to the factory owner's utter lack of compassion or responsibility for their dead and injured workers is unapologetically plain spoken. I don't know how long I stayed in St. Vincent's, but when I was well, the Red Cross came with my clothing, which they got from my family, and took me straight to the mountains for a rest. At the same time, the Red Cross paid my family $10 a week for 10 weeks. I never got a dime's worth of help from the company. Gilded Age America was a society in which laissez-faire capitalism and the pursuit of profit was lauded above all else, an era when labourers, especially emigrants, were viewed and treated as disposable cogs in a relentless churning machine. 
Certainly, there had always been philanthropists and reformers, well-intentioned, even enlightened souls, determined to do their bit. At the turn of the century, the rise of organised labour had made some modest gains in steel mills and coal mines. Garment trade unions such as the ILGWU had caught factory owners off guard in 1909 with the uprising of the 20,000, the industry-wide strike, mounted mostly by women workers, which had resulted in modest concessions that mitigated some of the misery of their daily lives. But sweated labour remained exactly that, poorly paid, conditions inhumane and all too often dangerous. Before the Triangle Fire, substantive workplace reform had remained largely an elusive dream. The Triangle Fire not only made national but global headlines in its day, both for its massive scale, 146 dead and 78 injured, and maddening preventability. Even in a time when fires, both residential and commercial, were fairly commonplace in metropolises like New York, the Triangle stands out as a particularly painful chapter in the city's history. The madness and mishaps skirting Shakespearean tragedy. The particulars, locked doors, exits denied lest a scrap of silk go missing, pointed to the perceived dispensability of certain fellow human beings. More so than any other single industrial event, the Triangle Fire seems to wag a finger at New York's and by an extension America's much-touted melting pot of cultures, not only shaming the established power brokers, but also the emigrant titans, the so-called shirtwaist kings, who ought to have done better by their own, but didn't. The Triangle owners, veterans of the needle trade, and themselves Jewish immigrants from Russia, had powerful allies in the city. Instead of fines and threats of closure, a blind eye was turned to their repeated transgressions with a deadly result. 146 people dead, the youngest just 14. Most were emigrants from Eastern Europe and Southern Italy, who spoke little or no English nearly all united in the belief that hard work would lead them to better lives and quite possibly to achieving the most elusive of myths, the American dream. The Triangle Fire would remain the most devastating workplace disaster to occur in New York State until the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. The same year, the last living Triangle survivor, 107-year-old Rose Friedman, no relation of Celia's husband, Morris, passed away. Because of the fire and the public outcry that ensued, New York State enacted legislation to safeguard the health and safety of workers, laws that subsequently served as a model for national labour and safety reform across the US. Mandatory workplace fire drills, sprinkler system installation, regulated working conditions and limits on working hours are all reforms that resulted from the tragedy. As we approach the fire's 110th anniversary, this March 2021, the story of the Triangle and the women and men who worked there lives on in both the stories of survivors like Celia Walker and Annie Doherty and in the memory of those workers who never made it out. Since 2004, on the 25th of March, volunteers from the Chalk Project scrawled the names of 146 victims on the footpaths and sidewalks outside their last known residence in the city to preserve the memory of the men and women and the fire that took them much too young and much too soon. That brings an end to this mini-series on the fire. Next week, I'll be starting my series on the Irish War of Independence. 